Hi, I'm going to start my next video and that's going to be on the gas laws. So let me move over to our next slide. Excuse me, let's go back. Um, there are three named gas laws. There's Boyle's Law, there's Charles's Law, and there's Gay-Lussac's Law. And there's also Combined Gas Law and Ideal Gas Law. Today I'm going to be talking about Boyle, Charles, and Gay-Lussac's Law. So that's what we'll be talking about first. All right, so what is Boyle's Law? It's talking about how pressure and volume vary when temperature and moles of gas is held constant. So T and N are held constant, but we want to know what happens with pressure and temperature. I mean, pressure and volume. So as pressure increases, volume decreases. So we have our little container. We saw it with the plunger before. This is the plunger. These are our molecules of gas. Now we take the plunger and we move it down here. And now the same five molecules of gas are in half as much space as pressure, um, I'm sorry, as volume decreased, V went down, P went up. So the relationship between pressure and volume is as pressure increases, volume decreases, and vice versa. And this is the equation we're going to get that shows us that. Now, if there were temperature in here, it would have to be in Kelvin. So I'm just making note of that right now. So let's do a little bit more with this. Okay, so there's a Boyle's Law demo. And if you click the link in the actual PowerPoint that you have, then you will be able to go to this demo. I won't be able to do it here because I'm in a PDF. And then this little diagram will show you some nice little visuals about how pressure and um, volume will vary if the temperature stays the same, and it'll show you the graph being developed. So I would definitely go into that and click those links. All right, so here's volume, here's pressure. So if we have a very big volume, and we would do this in our classroom using a syringe. We have big syringes in class, and they have plungers. And what we would have done is we would have taken the plunger and we would have moved it into different places. And we would have been able to see, as we move this plunger in, how the pressure, we have a little pressure sensor that we would have hooked it up to, and we would have been able to read what the pressure was. Okay, and we would have been able to say, okay, oh, the pressure is going up as I squeeze this air that's inside the syringe. Okay, and so that's how this data is determined. So if my volume is 60, my pressure is 1. If my volume is 30, my pressure is 2. And it doesn't go down at a straight rate because as we get smaller and smaller here, we have a lot of pushback and it's hard to increase the pressure after you get to a small container. So that is the relationship with volume and pressure, and it's called Boyle's Law. So let's do some practice. We already know that this is our equation. Okay, so on your gas law sheet, you should have it right there next to you right now, and you're gonna put these variables in it. Actually, let's go back. I should have started with that, sorry. Um, have your gas law sheet out. On the sheet for gas laws, it says, um, what are the constants? Hey, here, temperature and moles of gas. And what's other information? Well, you've got to use Kelvin. All right? And I always suggest that you write your given. So that's the three things I would put as important information. So let's go back. All right, so we have a balloon containing 30 liters of helium. This is the equation we're going to use. So writing our given is very important here. All right. One and one mean the initial, and two and two are the final. So we have 30 liters. So we say our volume, don't just say 30 liters, say that it's volume. That's initial. And we have the gas pressure. KPA we recognize is one of our pressure units, 103, well, KPA. All right, so that's our initial, and then it says, what is the volume
that's our unknown, when the balloon rises to an altitude where the pressure is only 25 kPa. I want to talk about that in a second. All right, remember we said when you're on Mount Everest, there's less pressure. So the helium balloon is going to go up, up, up into the air, and eventually the pressure is going to get lower and lower. And so the balloon will get bigger. All right, temperature remains constant. Now, if we had just started this problem and we didn't have anyone telling us it was boil, we would have written down our given and we would have seen that the temperature doesn't change, right? So we would not have one of the gas laws where there's temperature in it because we don't have to worry about it. If it stays the same, it just would cancel out from both sides. Okay, so here's our information. We're going to plug it in. We have our P1 is 103 kPa. And I like you to use units when you're just starting out here so that you can realize why the units work. All right, so that's our P1, V1. And we know our P2, so that's 103. And then we have X is our V2. All right, so KPA is on both sides, so that goes away. That's going to cancel, isn't it? Whoops, I did something wrong. I wrote the wrong pressure. Let's go back. Sorry about that. I'm getting better, but I'm not that perfect yet. <laughs> All right, so 25.0, because I used the wrong, and this is pretty common mistake that people do. They put the wrong numbers in the wrong places. All right, so that's our second pressure, and it should go down because we're way up in the atmosphere now, and X. Okay, so KPA is going to cancel, and then liters will be our unit. Doesn't that make sense? Because X is volume, okay? So we do all this out. You can solve this and say, I'm solving for V2, and say P1, V1, and now we divide both sides by P2 equals V2. When we get to the combined gas law where there's six variables, I really recommend that you do this. I feel it's not as necessary for this particular one because all the values are in the numerator not the denominator, so that makes it easier. Okay, so when we calculate this all out, we're going to get, let me, I've done it out again, I got 124 liters. Okay, so this isn't scientific, it doesn't have to be, they mean the exact same thing, but that is our volume too. All right, and that's our first gas law problem. Let's go on. All right, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Well, they're telling me it's Boyle's Law. If they're telling me it's Boyle's Law, I'm going to just use the equation. So let's write down our given. It says a gas with a volume, okay, V1 is equal to 4.0 liters, oops, 4.00 liters, at a pressure of 205 kPa. We can use any pressure unit, but this is what they're giving to us. I'll be using some others soon so that you'll get the hang of other pressure units. Um, is allowed to expand to a volume of 12 liters. So now our new volume is going to be 12. All right. And now we now to know what is the pressure in the container. All right. So we're doing all this, um, it's saying temperature remains constant. So we know if temperature remains constant, we don't have to worry about it. Okay, plug in. We have 205 kPa. We have 4 liters is equal to, our pressure is X now, and our volume is 12.0 liters. Okay, and when we solve it, we get our answer to be 68.3 kPa is the new pressure. All right, that's pressure two. Hopefully this is making sense so far. It'll get more complicated, I'm sure. All right, so that's Boyle's Law.
pretty straightforward math, but this is so important, writing down your given. When we get to mixed mole problems, you won't know what law to use. So if you don't write down your given, you won't know where you need to go. We wrote down everything. We didn't have to worry about temperature. We said constant. So we can assume that it's going to be Boyle's Law because the variables here are all that we need to change. Um, by the way, the gas law summary sheet or something like it will be given to you on any assessment that you give. You don't have to memorize your equations. You just need to know how to use them. All right, let's go on. All right, now we're going to talk about Charles's Law. And Charles's Law is the relationship between temperature and volume. So I love to use a little balloon for this. Okay, so I have a balloon. And if I heat the balloon up, what do you think is going to happen to it? Put like a, pretend like we wouldn't burn the plastic. That's a candle. Okay, so the candle is lighting under and it's going to make it get bigger. Okay, our balloon will get bigger. If we put it in ice, a dish with ice, what will happen is it will get smaller. Okay, as temperature goes up, volume goes up. As temperature goes down, volume goes down. What's going on here? The particles inside the balloon Here, they're moving at a certain rate. They have a certain amount of wishies on them, right? Here, they're moving at a rate with more energy. So they're hitting the sides of the container more and they're pushing that container apart. Here, the wishies are moving much less. So it's not going to hit the sides of the container and it will shrink. Temperature and volume. That is what Charles's Law is all about. All right, here's the equation. It's hard to write fractions in this, so it's V1, T1 equals V2 over T2. Okay, that's what that is representing. Now, here's where it's so important. We must use temperature only in Kelvin. Here's showing a balloon in ice water, and here's the balloon on a hot plate and you can see how the balloon gets larger. And here's the picture that goes along with it. As one goes up, temperature goes up, volume goes up. Let me make sure I wrote that in the last one because, oh my gosh, I wrote it, okay, down and down. Well, you said it right, good for me. I'm not gonna do it right. Okay, temperature and Kelvin only. All right, direct relationship. Let's go back for a second. Okay, let's call this in, an inverse or indirect relationship. Okay, and let's look at the graph to see what that means. It means as one goes up, the other goes down. And vice versa. Okay. So here, now we're saying temperature goes up, volume goes up. Temperature goes down, volume goes down. All right, and it is a direct relationship because whatever one variable does, the other variable does it as well. All right, again, when you're in the PowerPoint itself, I would really suggest that you click on this demo of Charles's Law and view this little diagram because it has some animations to it and you can see how the graph is created as they use heat here to heat up the um, gas, okay? And this is the graph, get, you know, the graph that we come up with. In our labs, one of the labs we've done every year is we calculate what absolute zero is. And we know absolute zero is where no movement of particles. Particles do not move at absolute zero.
And so the Charles Law Lab we do, we extrapolate and we figure out that at minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, we are at absolute zero. And that is the place that they called zero in Kelvin. And it's theoretical. They do not believe they can ever have a particle become absolute zero. They've gotten really close. They've gotten to nano Kelvin, but they, they don't think they can ever make a particle have no movement. Okay, so that's what all of this Kelvin scale is based on. And the reason we love it is because since we can't get to absolute zero, we won't have calculations that have zeros in them. And you're going to see why that's important in just a second. I would definitely go to the PowerPoint and view this slide and try to link on the demos. All right. So we're going to do our equation. We said V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. What if we have a temperature of zero? Is that okay? Can we divide by zero? No, we cannot. It's undefined, okay? And if we have a negative, it won't be proportional to what kinetic energy is. So we must use Kelvin. Kelvin. All right, so when we're making our list of variables, our givens, we're going to make sure we get it into Kelvin. So we have temperature one is 24 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, I know I said 273.15 plus, right here. Equals our Kelvin. It's a lot of sig figs. Those are there in case we need them. But in this one, we probably won't need them. So we're just going to add plus 273. And I don't feel like measuring that right now, so I'm going to look it up. And so I get um, 297K. And then my V1 is equal to 4 liters. And it's 4.00 because we want some sig figs. All right, then we have T2 and V2. All right, our T2 is 58 degrees Celsius. And we get 331. Okay. And we want to know what our new volume is. So when we do this, it is so much easier for you if you rearrange this because we want to find this. And when we have variables that are at the bottom, it just makes it a little more complicated to do the math. So here's my suggestion, cross multiply. So let's do that, V1 times T2. See that, I'm gonna cross multiply that there. And I'm gonna leave this guy on the bottom because when we cross multiply, and your V2. Well, basically what we did is we multiplied both sides by T2. Multiplied by T2. And when we multiply, yeah, multiply both sides by T2, we get rid of this. This one goes away, this one goes away, and this is what we get. All right, when we're solving for temperature especially, I would truly recommend this. All right, so let's start our problem. V1 is four liters. T2 is 331 Kelvin. T1 is 297 Kelvin. Okay, when we're done, the Kelvins cancel, and we're going to get our answer of 4.46 liters, and that's equal to V2. All right, let's think about it. All right, our first volume was 4 liters and our temperature went up. So we know if temperature went up, what should happen to volume? Volume should go up. Did it? Well, yes, it did. So that makes us feel confident that we have a good answer. All right, that's our first Charles Law. Let's go on.
all right, I'm not going to, I'm going to pretend I don't know what a um, law to use. So let's write down our given. We have a volume, we'll call it one, it's equal to 5.00 liters. All right, and then we have a temperature of one, it's equal to minus 50. And zero degrees Celsius. Okay, add 273 to that, and when I add 273 to minus, let me make sure I got the right number, I get 223 Kelvin. I'm not going to do the math out every time for all of those. Then I have V2, um, that's our X, and our temperature now, T2, is equal to 100 Okay, I add 273 to that and I get 373 Kelvin. Again, equation V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. I rearrange, I say V1, T2 over T1 equals V2. And I don't have to memorize any of this. All I have to do is memorize this. Okay, plug and chuck. So we have five liters. T2 is 373. T1 is 223 Kelvin, sorry. And when I calculate that out, I get 8.36 liters. All right, so now we're going to check it. So our um, temperature went up significantly and our volume went up. Okay, a little, not quite doubled. So yay, that's a good check and that makes us believe in our answer. All right, let's continue. Now we're going to talk about the um, relationship between pressure and temperature. So if I have a container, now I'll use a container that can change size. It's a rigid container like a scuba tank or something. And I have my particles in it. Okay, it has a certain pressure. Now if I heat it up, my candle, what's gonna happen? I have the same amount of particles in there, but these are gonna be moving so much faster. These are moving a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. All right, particles will move so much faster. So as I heat it, my temperature is going up. So my pressure is going to go up because I'm going to have more hits and harder. They will hit the sides of the container harder and they will hit the sides of the container more often because each particle has so much more energy. Okay, that's all that's changed. All right, again, it's a direct relationship because as one goes up, the other goes up. And when we say that as one goes up, the other goes up, then this is the equation we'll get. Again, it's hard to write fractions in a PowerPoint, so we do like this. As you've been going along, you have been writing down each gas law. You've been saying what is constant, volume and moles. So this is V and N are constant in this. And um, I didn't do it for Charles, but you can go back and make sure you do that. And what do we have to remember? That we better use Kelvin. And it's always good to rearrange the equation when we solve for these. Okay. So here's a picture. It's showing a container. Now the container is heated. They're moving much faster and the pressure went up. As T increased, P increased, direct relationship. Again, I have a bunch of links. This is a link to a demo for Davis X law. And here's, I don't have a graph for it, but we know that if we have temperature here and pressure here, as temperature increases, pressure should increase as well. And if you look at this little clip, you'll be able to see that as well. Okay. All right, have you ever heard of a pressure cooker? 
maybe your parents have used one or you've seen one on one of these cooking channels. Food is cooked more quickly because at the higher pressure, the boiling point of water rises from 100 degrees to 121 degrees. So your pasta will cook much faster if it has more pressure on it because the boiling point will actually go up. Um, you've heard of aerosol cans carrying warnings, you know, those little spray cans, because they're a fixed size container. So if you throw it into a fire, which people used to do back in my youth, which was very unsafe, because eventually you get above the pressure that the container can handle and it bursts and that's where you can have some danger. All right, and it's why you're not allowed to put them into incinerators and into landfills. So just a piece of info. All right, go to the sex lab. The gas in an aerosol can is at a pressure of 103 kPa at 25 degrees Celsius. If the can is thrown into a fire, what will the pressure be when the temperature reaches 928 Celsius? Okay, let me have mine available here. So I have my numbers worked out for you. Okay, I'm missing a page. Here it is. All right, so we have P1. 103 kPa. And the temperature one equals 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so P2, T2, 2 equals, I'm going to call that X, um, 928 degrees Celsius. Okay, 273 plus 25 is 298. And then 928 plus 273, let me write it down, is 1201. Okay, so we can get this started. So again, the equation is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. I would love for you to rearrange it. That means we multiply both sides. We want to get rid of this. This is what we're solving for, so let's get rid of this. Times T2 on both sides. We get P1 T2 divided by T1. All right, so we plug and chug. We have 103 kPa. We have um, 298, nope, 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 that's on the bottom, sorry, 298 Kelvin. And then this is going to be 1201 one Kelvin. When we're all done, the, kel the Kelvin will cancel and you'll have kPa as your unit. Okay, so I did it again and I calculated it out and I got 415 kPa. I'm going to take this time right now to convert from one pressure unit to another pressure unit. So what if I wanted to know what it is in atmospheres? Okay. So I would go back to my sheet where you wrote down all the different pressures and what you would find is that 101.3 kPa is equal to one atmosphere and it's 1.000 atmosphere okay so we would take our kpas 415 and we do some dimensional analysis we say time sign fraction line kpa on the bottom atmospheres on the top because these two things are equal to each other and we'd put the 101.3 and one atmosphere there and let me just do it on my calculator right now. 415 divided by 101.3 equals, and you would get 4.10 when you round it. So if a container has 4.10 atmosphere when it goes into the fire, there's a good chance it would burst. So that gives you some idea. So this was the answer for the actual question, but this is us learning how to convert 
to new pressure unit. What if you were solving for pressure and it didn't really tell you what pressure to solve for? Well, then you could choose whichever one you want. You don't have to worry about it. Let's go on. One more for Gay-Lussac's law. Write down our given, um, the pressure in the car tire. 198 kPa. Okay, T1 equals 227. And let me write down what that is. Pressure in the car tire is 300 Kelvin. The hardest part is for me finding it on my paper. And then our what is the temperature? P2 is given at 225 kPa, and now we want to know T2. All right, this is probably one of the most difficult, or I shouldn't say it's not that difficult, but it's the most mistaken question because people like to plug right into this, and what they do is they solve for x on the bottom because this is where our x is. And when they don't rearrange, if you don't rearrange this equation, then you're going to have some issues. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply by T2 on both sides. And what we'll get is P1 T2 over T1 equals P2. You could have just cross multiplied in this case as well. So now we're going to multiply by T1 both sides. I'm showing all the algebra to get to what you the equation you really want to use. All right, so these are going to cancel. So we have P1 T2 equals P2 T1. And now we're going to get rid of um, the P1. So we divide by P1, both sides. And these will cancel. And so here's what we have. We say T2 is equal to P2 T1 P1. It's just algebra. Don't be afraid of it. I go through all the steps here. Okay? And it'll really save you if you try to just plug in. It, oftentimes you will get the wrong answer. So be careful. Okay. So let's see what we got. So P2 in this case is 225 kPa. Not the P. <laughs> it doesn't like to make the P. All right, and T1 is 300K. So now I could just use this as my template of who's going to go in to my calculation. And then P1 was 198. All right, and that's equal to T2. And now when you do your solving, you're going to get an answer that you like. All right. You're going to get 341K. Well, this is a good time to say, sometimes they'll say, what is the temperature in Celsius? So this is the answer that they wanted here. They didn't specify. But if I want the answer in Celsius, I say 341 minus 273. We're leaving off the 0.15 because there are no sig figs out there. And that's how we get 68 degrees Celsius. So depending on what they ask for, you can do what you need to do. This is Kelvin, and this is the calculation to compare from Kelvin to Celsius. Okay, and there you go. That's how you do that. All right, so let me move on to the next thing. And the next thing we'll talk about are the combined gas laws.